Visit No One Likes Us Clothing for all your Millwall clobber. www.noonelikesus.co.uk Hi, I'm Gary Rowett, and you're listening to the world-famous Acton Millwall. Good morning, dear listeners. A Thursday morning in the in the kind of current turmoil of the will he or won't he be with us on Saturday, Gary Rowett story, listeners. I, I thought I'd make use of that little jingle just because I don't really know how many more times I'll be able to play it. Um, joining me to uh, chew over the current Millwall cut and discuss his new book is Mill Stallworth, Merv Payne. Welcome back to the show, Merv. It's great to have you back again, mate. Hi, Nick. It's good to be there. And a much better reception. Last time that Merv and I spoke, <laughs> listeners, it reminded me of the old um, Ronnie Barker, uh, Ronnie Corbett sketch, where they, they, they went on Mastermind. I think they asked the, answered the previous question. It was a bit like that on uh, slow internet speeds in my end, I'm, I'm blaming. Merv, it's, it's great to have you on the show, mate. We, we're in a, a strange kind of very Millwall um, pickle at the moment. <laughs> There's a story doing yeah. around that West Bromwich Albion are uh, interested um in, in Gary Rowett taking him mm-hmm. on as, as their replacement manager. And it's a very strange article. I mean, it's, it's not quite a denial, it's not quite an acknowledgement no. on on, no. on the um London News Online. I don't know if you've seen it. It's it's a, it's an oddly worded piece, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think we're at that stage now. I mean I first saw some stories online yesterday mentioning it, but it was all a lot yeah. of the unofficial a lot of like the fan based football sites and that sort of thing. Yeah. So there was nothing, nothing from the red tops or the, the tabloids. And today, the, the 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 papers have got hold of it. I think reading through all the various stories it is speculation. And, and knowing from my time working at newspapers and stuff, it's it's very easy to fill some column inches with a bit of speculation like this when a manager leaves one club. And I think Gary Rowett's sort of become the um, Alan Kerbishley or Tim Sherwood of the Championship now. Because <laughs> I think I think every time. Because I think there was a lot of speculation in the summer that he, he, he basically he was going to QPR and taking a couple of players with him. It was, you know, we, yeah, we were told yeah. it was as good as done. That was it. He was going to QPR. And then he signs a new contract um, and that all that all disappeared. But I think I think there's a lot of um, joining up of the dots being done by the fact that it's West Brom. They're in the Midlands and, of course, Rowett's... He lives there. Yeah. Yeah, Rowett's yeah. Manage, managerial career pre mill was entirely in that area. You know, Burton... Uh, Birmingham Stoke so um I think there's a lot of guesswork going on but you know I wouldn't, I wouldn't I, dismiss it totally. no. I mean there's, there's always this kind of um no I wouldn't be surprised either no. to be honest and there's always this yeah. kind of um the easy put down that you can give to this is it's paper talk which is derived yeah. from agent agent talk mm-hmm. I mean the agent yeah. agents are the great villains of the of yeah. the modern game, but um, presumably Gary Rowett appoints his agent to get the best possible deals he possibly can. Absolutely, for yeah, yeah. He's earning a living, as 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 we all have to. Yeah. So, um, and it would make some degree of sense. I, I suppose the uh, the key question really is whether West Bromwich Albion would be um, would be interested in him. Um, and I'm just looking. I was looking at the Mill History website, listeners, because obviously we're here to talk about Merv's new book, and we'll come on to that. I'm just looking at the the list of recent managers. Certainly, since um, since the period we will be talking about, Merv, the, the yeah. kind of Rhino Macca and and onwards. Mm. And if you exclude uh, the two, I suppose special cases of Kenny Jacket and then Neil Harris, both of whom were five and a half years in Kenny's case, four and a half years in in Neil's case. So fairly yeah. um, fairly extensive periods. Really, only talking about. Mark McGee with three years uh, yeah. under uh, under his belt in the, in the period that we'll come on to mm. uh, the early two thousands, and then you've got Gary Rowett who is just shy of um, by a few days of, of uh, three years, two years, eleven yeah. months, twenty one days as we mm. as we speak. It's quite a period of time, actually. It's you know by middle standards, that's a that's a long tenure in the job, isn't it? In recent times, it is. I mean, I think in current football standards in general. I mean, you've got to look at one end of the scale, you've got Watford, who are changing yeah. managers quicker than the Conservatives are changing leader. And um, <laughs> and I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, but then you've got, you know, clubs like uh, Wickham. Wickham sort of impressed me with how they, they've stuck with their manager, you know, no matter what, going up and down. And 
I think, yeah. It's, but yeah, I think, but certainly by Millwall standards, by championship standards, three years is um, it's probably the shelf maximum shelf life of a manager, really. So um, I was going to ask a question. I'm, I'm, I'm almost answering the question in my own head as I'm as I'm going to yeah. ask it to you. So it's unfair, really, because. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone can actually answer this question, but I was just trying to think of managers who were loved at the then, and they're actually quite mm. few and far between, really. I mean, I'd say Neil Harris because of his playing career, but then his managerial achievements too, Nick mm. um, Yeah. And Kenny, Kenny Jacket, did he fall into the loved? Probably did to some extent. He was certainly sorry to see him go uh, when he when he went. Otherwise, it's. There aren't many that really that every you know like politics. Every Millwall management job finishes in a, in a kind of a, 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 a tumult, doesn't it? You know, they, they never, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you I don't leave that, loved, do you? No, Millwall. I mean, not only is that sort of the nature of football management, but it's definitely it's the nature of football fans or certainly Millwall fans. And I think it reminds me of um, you know talk about the Rhino and Macca era, and I yeah. think uh, when Theo Pafit is appointed them. He made public, I think he even said it in his programme notes, he basically said, when I gave him the job, I said, you do realise one day I'm going to have to sack two Millwall legends. Because he knew, <laughs> yeah, because he knew by the very nature of football management, you know, it's, um, I think... It's a ruthless business. It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, going back to my college days, I think, is it the Peter Principle? I think there was a thing we went back called the Peter Principle, where you get promoted and promoted in a job yeah. until you get to a position you can't do it anymore and you, 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 you know, you totally fail and everyone hates you. So I think that's that's the way. I think that's the way it is management. I mean, some some managers have got it off to a fine art. People like Mourinho and that, will, and I think Ericsson did it. They'll just they'll be in demand purely because of their reputation. They'll take the job, take the money, and you know, and then just if it all goes wrong, just walk away with it. You know, with another big sack of money. But um, yeah. It's an interesting question. I mean, on a total tangent, really, off from what we, we started to, to uh, the, the purpose of today's call, listeners. But I was watching um, Rangers get slaughtered last night by <laughs> Liverpool, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which is a, a turnaround in form for Liverpool. Um, and Jurgen Klopp, I suppose, would come as close to adulation as, as any manager, maybe Guardiola, I don't know, but certainly mm -hmm. Jurgen Klopp has come close to a kind of like almost a, a physical embodiment of uh, a club, uh, and thereby half, at least half of the city, possibly the whole city, you could argue. But yeah. anyway, in recent times, a very successful manager and, and, yeah. and, and, a, and a man with a very strong personal image. But mm. of course, it only lasts as long as you're winning stuff. And this season, Liverpool, until last night, I suppose you'd argue, maybe last few games, have started to show glimpses of the of the side that they, they were and some would yeah. say still should be. Uh, but, you know, even Jurgen Klopp, I mean, you know, haggard looking, you know, was it the, the private mm. eye description, ashen the face, Ron Lee on the side of the yeah. of the field. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. a very strange uh, profession, isn't it? You, you, you really are only as good as your last couple of results in, in football. Yeah, right? definitely. And the funny thing with Klopp is there's this seven year theory. Have you heard this? Where he's only no. spent, he only spent no. seven years at his previous two clubs. Dortmund. After seven years. Yeah. yeah things things okay. started to go wrong. And, and, you know, bizarrely, even now, you're in a few Liverpool fans on all the phone-ins and stuff, starting to have a few murmurs about, you know, yeah, the change, which is, is, you know, it's amazing, really, when you think about it. I don't, I don't think you'll ever see another Fergie or Wenger, to be honest. I don't think those days... Lasting that for 20 years or so yeah, in the yeah, job. They're, def they're definitely long gone because everyone's just too impatient. I think you even get League Two fans who ask a couple <laughs> of defeats want the manager out, you know, would... I mean, you think back to when we started going to Mill Wall, you wouldn't, you know, you, you, you wouldn't dream no. of questioning the... Hound, uh, it took a lot to hound out a manager. I mean, I'm just looking at actually yeah. at a manager. I mean, going back a long while here, listeners, so forgive me. I mean, obviously, Benny Fenton, eight years, eight and a half years, mm -hmm. just short, which is which stands aside. But I mean, even someone like Gordon Jago, I, I, I suppose, left in a, under a quite specific cloud, yeah. really, given what else was going yeah. on. But he was three, three yeah. years in the job. Yeah, um, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I wonder. I'm just looking at the, the the numbers on on the Mill History website, which is a go to website. Listeners, if you ever mm. want to do a podcast, I, I recommend you read up on Mill History because you'll sound like you know what you're talking about, <laughs> like I do. Um, but I mean, you know, Gary Rowett's record is, is is win rate, which is you know, I suppose you can argue statistics. Thirty eight and a half percent. This is not far short of Neil Harris's. Not far short. Yeah. Of, Kenny Jackets and uh but then you got Willie Donerkey on a win rate of 42.5%. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> St uh, statistics. 
<laughs> yeah, lies and lies. That's, yeah. That's, that's definitely, yeah. I mean, I, was funny, <laughs> I think last week I saw a post on Twitter. Um, I think it was after the Rotherham game. Um, someone said, um, basically, we're no better off under route than we were under Neil Harris. And I was about to reply and sort of make the point that I believe, you know, I'm not 100% happy with the way we're, we're playing. No, I do believe, no, I do believe Rowett's taken us from a team that's grateful to avoid the bottom three into a team that's expecting to burst into top six. Then I looked at the table and I thought, well, if you want to be really pedantic about it, we're almost exactly three years on from when we sat Neil Harris and we're in a similar sort of league position because, you know, the fact that we finished in the top eight in the last three seasons is really is academic because the championship moves it's so by the far. Yeah. yeah, there's so much, there's so much money sloshing around, so much spending power. And if you think if you've got teams like Middlesbrough and West Brom struggling, then I know a lot of Millwall fans hate it when we we say this, but we are punching above our weight. You know, I mean, you have to sort of be fair. I mean, I said I've been critical of Rowett in in the, in the previous months, but you do have to think about exactly what sort of job he's got on. Our average attendance is about is it about twelve, thirteen thousand? It's in that which, bracket. I'll have a look yeah, actually whilst which, I've got the. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I think on a club on our sort of resources. Playing in the, or competing in the championship, I think it's like going to Las Vegas for two weeks and taking fifty quid spending money. You know, you've got to. It's not. You know, the money's yeah. soon going to run out, and you're going to have to gamble sooner or later. And uh, or if, if you don't want to gamble, you play it careful. But um, yeah, but yeah I, I, mean, I know what you mean. Yeah. We're 13, 13 and a half thousand, which is yeah, pretty good. It is good, um, yeah. But it compares um, with the. Uh, era under Neil Harris towards the mm. the kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, higher you know the, the better the better kind of periods under Neil yeah, Harris. Yeah. But it compares very favourably with I'm saying managers who were loved, and I'm I'm, I'm mentioning Kenny Jacket, but also the early period of Neil Harris, where you albeit yeah. a different division, but mm-hmm. you know eight thousand, ten thousand, yeah, twelve thousand. Yeah. So yeah. you know it's it, it's a hard one. Um, will you, if he does go? I mean, we, we the, the the article on London News Online is is ambivalent, really. Murphs, whether he is yeah, or yeah. isn't interested in the yeah. job, mm. probably never get an answer on that. Would you miss no. him if he goes? I, I, I... <laughs> that. A, I know. I've had I've had that many discussions on on Twitter about this. You know, you, you, if you start to get a bit fed up with, with what's going on, and people say, "Well, who are we going to get instead?" Then and and yeah. there's always that for me. There's always that sort of better the devil you know situation or you know we, we do have a we do have a bit of a reputation for giving the wrong man the job thinking about low mass and holloway um, yeah we don't change managers very well or very easily well i, I suppose no, we you don't. Can argue that we no, did so, harris to row it harris, um, Har- harris to row it was a was a was a good a good move but um there's a real shortage of you know ideal candidates around now and i uh, someone mentioned uh cowley at portsmouth yesterday but you know, I'm not. I'm not sure if he's fully, you know, justified yeah. that reputation he built at Lincoln. Really, I mean, I think he was badly treated at Huddersfield. I think he's doing okay at Pompey. But um, yeah, one thing I would say with uh, Gary Rowett, and you know, we can we can talk to the cows come home about the poor yeah. quality of the football, and it has been. I mean, you mm. you know, uh, 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 one of the uh, someone replied, Tony Monday replied back to me today on online mm. talking about the kind of general, I don't know if it's celebratory mood that Rowett might be moving on, but there's certainly some, um, you know, some fans out there, a lot of fans perhaps who would not be too sad to see him move on. Yeah. But the point being made that we've, we, we've been now become a consistent top half of the championship level performer as a club in the last yeah. few years or yeah. so, which is pretty good. Again, when mm. you look at, you know, the period we're going to be looking at is, is the achievement mm. of championship football from the third yeah. tier, which has been historically Absolutely. Millwall's shuttle, isn't it? You know, up was yep. and downwards. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that we've attracted some decent players under Gary Rowett. Now, would, would we attract decent players? But we, we did under Neil Harris to some extent. Um, yeah, I think, I think Rowett will, came will in. Have anybody else? I don't know. It's, it's hard, yeah. one, isn't it? It's this funny when Rowett came in a few months after one of our biggest sort of summer transfer windows ever. You I mean you had um, Matt Smith and Bod Varson yeah. and Bar, yeah. and obviously they didn't all and work Scan out. Scanac, I mean these were expensive players. Oh, you know. Totally forgot about him. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think yeah, and I think Rowett got hold of that squad and thought, well, I can do a little bit better with this, and and, and took them on. But it was yeah. Neil Harris's squad. I think he spent the three years so far. Um, sort of whittling it down and bringing in his own players. Well, I say that, but I'm not sure. I mean, apparently we were chasing um, Fleming and 
Foggle Slammer for three years. So I wonder if that, Apparently wonder so. if that yeah. yeah, yeah. I wonder if that precedes Rowett's tenure, and if that says says something about the uh, recruitment process. But you know, he's got he's, he's got what he describes as his strongest ever squad, which yeah. makes which makes the uh, the tactics or the way the way we sort of play a little even more disappointing, really. Because I think there's a lot of, I mean, I think. I mean, I always believe certain teams, football, all football clubs, have their own sort of DNA. And I think we've Mill have always played, have always been better when they're playing sort of high tempo, not not direct as such, but sort of high tempo football. And all the good teams, Mill teams, I remember had like pacey wingers and you know strong centre forwards and that sort of thing. And it, it sounds a bit of a cliche and a bit of a generalisation, but you know, it, it's, it's absolutely. True. I think it's the absolutely. nature of the fans. I mean. Classic example of so I went to Blackpool but back in January it was and uh, you know the fact there was a good turnout there the fans were in good voice and we were just this whole containment this whole do, just don't lose thing you know and and it's literally silenced the away fans to the point where the Blackpool fans were sort of taking the piss out of us and you sort, and you thought that's a, that's a sort of a direct reaction to the football we're playing you know there's only so much you can uh, cheer the team on and 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 try and rouse them if they're sort of just passing it backwards and forwards to each other <laughs> not crossing the halfway line. And on that day, I think Blackpool had, had a very average side. Blackpool they had one player that stood out, and that was the, the winger Bowler, who's gone now because he's you know he's a cracking yeah. player. And everything went through him, and of course it was him that led to the goal. And suddenly we're one nil down, and Rowett thinks, "Oh, I'll bring Tyler Bury on." And it was, we were transformed. You know, we were suddenly we were on the front foot. We were attacking. The defence looked visibly scared every time he got the ball. But because they were one nil up already, they could afford to sit back and stick two on him and and afterwards Rowett said oh I was hoping to sort of um I don't know what it was I, I think he said I think he made his game plan was I was hoping to keep it new and new as long as possible then bring Tyler Bury on and maybe nick one but I don't yeah, think that sort of his approach, it? No, I don't think that sort of football works and I don't think I think it's it's a bit like in in, in in cricket if you're trying not to get out in cricket you'll get out if you just play your natural game if you're batting I'm not a big cricketer to be honest I mean it sounds like it but I'm just I'm just repeating stuff that David Gower once said, I think, when I was watching the actors. But yeah, I mean, if you're if you're batting and you're trying not to get out, then the chances are you will get out. You'll make a mistake, or if you just play your natural game, and which is what I don't think we're doing. I think I can imagine a lot of players are quite frust- as frustrated as the fans, really. And um, I mean, there was a comment from Jed Wallace after we lost at home to Luton last year. I don't know if you remember it. Yeah, but basically, pra- basically praising um, Nathan Jones's style of football and how. He actually said how good it would be to play play that stuff. And I, and I sort of thought, I'm surprised no one really picked up on it because it's almost sounded like, God, I wish we played like that or, you know, we should play like that. Or Jed was such a creative player. And I do wonder if perhaps he was, even he was being stifled a little bit. But it, it would be quite you ironic. Do wonder. If, yeah, yeah, you do wonder. Um, it would be quite ironic if Rowett ends up at, at West Brom because they've got the midfield that I think we should have now, which is um, Jay Malumby and Jeb Wallace. The game before lockdown when we won 3 0 at Forest. And Smith got a hat trick, and we absolutely battered them. And Malumbi was unplayable, and Bennett was was on fire, and that that was a real attacking team. You know, we we looked really really good for a, to, for a charge for the playoffs, and of course then COVID came in, and it all went it all went pear shaped. And since then, it seems to be very sort of over sort of careful. It's, it's bizarre. Achtung, Milbein. So we're going to be talking about Merv's new book, a continuation in what I call the Mill History series that you've been writing, Merv. You started in the in the seventies, and now you've moved through the the uh, the eighties and nineties, and, and 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 so on. And here we are reaching one of my favourite periods in Mill history. I, I I love this period. It's the early two mm-hmm. thousands. Um, which covers obviously um, promotion um, from the uh, as champions in 2000, 2001, and then the wonderful until it all fell apart surge towards the mm-hmm. playoffs of 2001, 2002. Um, I'm just looking at the um, the Mill History website and it just covers such a it's almost a period that's that's um, it's like a jewel in my memory bank, Merv. It's a wonderful mm. period of time, isn't it? it was, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. we, what were your? I mean, you're, you, you've written the book. Um, yeah. what, what, what wonderful memories from, and what wonderful, wonderful players that we we were mm. fielding in these in these teams. It really stands Definitely. out, doesn't it, as a period of yeah. real history? Yeah, I think it's one of those sort of rare periods where everything just sort of clicked. You know, in a very similar way to the '87, '88 squad. Things yeah. were just. It must have been an absolute dream to manage for Mark McGee. Yeah. Um, and I think we had players that come out of the youth setup 
people like Cahill, um, Reed, and Eiffel, who yeah. went from being promising young third tier players to being straight into candidates for Premier League football. You know, it, I've never seen yeah. that. Sort of, yeah, I think only in the I think only in in terms of maybe Teddy Sheringham, have seen someone go from a young youth player to being that that good. And it was, it was brilliant to see. And you appreciate it even more now when you look back. You know, obviously, I'll go back and look at some of the the videos of, of, of the, the goals from that, that time. And you, you appreciate even more of what, what great players they were. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, it's almost like a, a, a load of talent fell into our laps. Because obviously, it comes out of the period of, well, initially, administration at the end of the 90s yeah, yeah. under Theo. And then mm. what I call the, the near-miss season of 1999 to... 2000, where we saw the, the the kind of framework of this side start to come together. Yes, definitely, yeah. Which, yeah. which was finishing playoff um, heartbreak against Wigan. Mm. It became a bit of a bogey yeah. side for us at this point. Did, though, yeah. Wigan, yeah. Wigan seemed to be in our way a lot at this time. As they well. were, yeah. It all yeah. started with that bloody auto glass, a windscreens final. <laughs> and and <that laughs> seemed to be, yeah, they seemed to become a bit of a nemesis after that until we sort of... Uh, yeah. Promotion. I mean, you know, and with managers of uh, Rhino and 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 um, Macca, we've mentioned that already. Talking about yeah, Gary Rowley, yeah. and mm-hmm. um, I mean, I, th- I think as so often with Mill, I mean, Mill, people are often quite displeased whenever we appoint any manager because it's always the cheap option. And I suppose even Billy Bonds was a cheap option if you if you want. And both of those players, both playing legends in their own ways. Were seen really at the start of their of their tenure as cheap options, weren't they? Very typically Millwall, cheap options. But they came they came good by developing a, the basis of a side that lives in the memory to this day for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the thing about Perfitis that I sort of learned when I'm going through this sort of period was um, he was always ready to admit if he got it wrong, and he admitted that he got the Billy Bonds appointment wrong. I don't think he appreciated the uh, strength of feeling amongst no. Millwall support with. Um, ex West Ham players or managers, um, but I mean Bonds. To be fair, was responsible for bringing the, the nucleus of that team through. I think he brought Nethercott in. He, he, he gave is. Harris, Neil Harris his debut. Although that's another story because apparently he didn't want Neil Harris, but allegedly. But um, he got him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I think Perfitis have realised he got it wrong and realised he needed someone with a, the, a Millwall identity. And and yes, yeah. I'm c- certainly certainly. Um, cost was a was an issue without a doubt, but I think once Rhino and Macca were able to sort of put their stamp on the team, if you like, I seem to remember Stephen saying he basically wanted every single team throughout from the academy up to the first team to play exactly the same system. You know, it was all, yeah. it was all quite quite straightforward. But you know, it's, it's you know you've got to have a plan. So many so many managers we've had in recent years don't seem to have a plan. They seem to make up as they go along. And, there's also and, no, yeah. no, there's no pretense on playing beautiful football. I mean, you know, the obsession, no, the no. modern obsession with um, yeah. passing the ball around. This was yeah. good old-fashioned, I don't know if it was Route 1, but it was certainly direct football, wasn't it? I mean, No, I think we've often you, been... You know, often players were assembled wrongly, to play that style, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I think we've often been wrongly accused of being too direct. I think, again, a classic example being the, um, the, the team in the first division under the dock. And people say, oh, you're direct, you just hoofed it towards Cascarino and showing. No, it's not the case when you look at the games in more detail rather than just the goals. You know, we did play a lot of nice football. You know, we had a lot of good footballing players. And, you know, Herlock himself Absolutely. was a good player. Dorsey, you know, Carter, O'Callaghan, they were all good footballing players. So I think the Docs' motto at the time was they um, they uh, they win the battle first. They sort of stamp their, <laughs> stamp their mark on the game, wear the opposition play down, the and then... They, yeah. Then they play the football, yeah, and that's a and that's not a bad. And obviously, Rhino and McCleary were brought up on that at Ethos. They were big parts of that team under the dock. So I don't think there was any complaints about sort of instilling that into his teams, really. And it it did work no. to an extent, and it, it went very suddenly wrong, which was quite bizarre. Well, it's you often know, the way. It, I mean, I, th- I think it hmm. went wrong under under the dock. It went wrong really under Rhino and Macco, although the, the team would evolve in the in the uh the you know the the, uh, the promotion and then the championship mm, season yeah, but yeah. it's quite interesting because obviously neil harris was also schooled in that no nonsense i think probably that's a better way to yeah, put it yeah approach yeah. to football you you didn't um you didn't pass the ball where it would serve no purpose you got it yeah forwards yeah. and played 
I suppose, as, as, as you just said there, Murph, um, mm. played your football in the danger areas of the opposition, which um, yeah, yeah. Fits, it, it fits and captures a Millwall psyche, really. This, 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 this period we're talking about, the early 2000s, captured the Millwall psyche, didn't it? I mean, the, mm. the football was yeah, no yeah. numbers, like 88 yeah. Yeah, classics. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so was this squad, you know, looking at mm. the names here. Yeah. You know, Denzel and Goal, you know, you, yeah. Robbie Ryan, Matt Lawrence, Nevercott, mm-hmm. I feel skillful players, Cahill, Neil Harris, yeah. Yeah. Lucas Neal. Um, mm-hmm. You know, direct, but played by skillful players. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a winning combination to some extent, it seems. At yeah, more. yeah. I think it's a system that always will always work for you in sort of the third tier. I think over the last 10 years, I think the quality, because mm. of, of the Premier League, whatever, the parachute payments and stuff, I think... I think it's got to a point where the championship's probably now close to the standard the Premier League was maybe 20 years ago. So it doesn't work. You can't just, you know, you can't do it sort of Wimbledon style anymore. You can't bully your way to success at that level, you know, in the same way you won't be able to do it again in the, in the Premier League. So I think that's the problem. I think that's what you, what you come up against, which is why you perhaps see teams like Rotherham bouncing backwards and forwards because they'll, they'll, they'll find it easy to get out of League One, but it won't work in the championship. I think that's the problem, that conundrum, which, and, and you captured it very well there, actually. It's, it's, we're just going to go back to Gary Rowett for a moment. Mm. That conundrum is what he's trying to solve because the, the in the Millwall blood, in our DNA, is a desire to see a, a cross between 1988, 2000, 2001, and maybe Steve Morrison up front, maybe Neil Harris is managing it. We want this kind of approach and yeah. the... Probably the you know the the lessons of of looking at Millwall history certainly is that it runs out of steam at a certain point. So you do need to bring something more yeah. Um, yeah. thoughtful, which is yeah. what he's you know I, I don't particularly defend Gary Rowett, Merv, but that's no. what he's trying to do. And and because you're yeah. not going to win with no. old school football like that, are you? No, no. I'm sure if, if you had him here now and, and put that to him, he'd probably say, well, if we go gung ho, you know, in our next match against Bristol City and then against Watford or whatever, then we, we, there's a danger we can get picked off and you can be we'll get beat two yeah. Nil, yeah, two nil down before there's anything you can do about it but then I mean at Sheffield United this season you know we were playing carefully again and within 20 minutes we were two nil down so yeah, you know, yeah around, the, around the right so, circle you go yeah exactly so there's there's an argument again for um, I think I think there's always been an argument for playing to your players strengths or or at least being a bit more uh, flexible I think but now the, he seems to be hell bent on this certain formation, which I think it's five at the back. I don't like to get involved in tactical talk because it's sort of. No, <laughs> I just I find it, especially, especially, on, especially on social media, when I find all these long threads about false tens and five at the back, <laughs> five at the back when you're in possession, and three at the back, or well, five at the back when you're not. I, I just find myself nodding off to sleep because I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think it's particularly interesting. But I, I think the I think, sad truth, yeah. Murph, is we come from a generation yeah. brought up on Teddy and Cass. <laughs> I'm yeah, trying. yeah, and I've, I've, I've always thought I've always maintained football is a very, very simple, very simple sport compared to most others, and I think it's easy to overcomplicate it a lot of the time. And I and I think people say, "Oh, well, you can't play four four two now because of whatever, whatever." But mm. the, the fact remains, football pitches are still very wide, <laughs> and if you've got yes. two players, yeah, if you've got two players who are very quick and skillful, like like an Eiffel, then you know no no defense is going to be able to you're going to cause defenses problems. And uh, for me, I think it is that straightforward, and yet. We haven't under Rowett, maybe not even under Neil Harris particularly, played with any sort of sort of pace or had anyone who I mean, obviously Jed Wallace would would run at teams at teams. But yeah. I just feel like we're lacking that um, that sort of slightly well, more high tempo, which I think Tyler Bury brings, but he doesn't seem to have faith in him starting, which is strange a strange one. No, I suppose um, Tyler Bury is as close to um, a number of times people have said on, on, on the podcast, we lack width, we width, width, mm. width. And Tyler yeah. is as close to yeah. a Paul, a Paul I feel, um, yeah. a, a Jimmy Carter, you know, the, these, yeah. these figures are um, imprinted on uh, even, even the, uh, you know, the Christoph Kinney to some extent, these, yeah, these figures absolutely. are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, imprinted on the Millwall, Millwall memory. I'm just looking at mm. the one, one of my favourite, I mean, it may, because I come from the seventies, listeners, I probably would have to go mm-hmm. back to the to some of the seventies and the eighties, certainly the promotion season. But two thousand, two thousand and one promotion season, Merv, is one of my uh, what, top three seasons ever. Mm, um, the, yeah. the, these are the days that you uh, that you, you live with, you know, in, in your mm-hmm. memory. 
to the end of your days. Just looking at yeah. it, it's surprising how much we dominated that division. We were, we went first, top of the league, just before Christmas 2000, and, and yeah. stayed there. Well, we, much. We, did, we had a bit of a wobble in March, and I sort of go into a bit of detail of that in the in the book because um, mm. we um, we had a, just a really weird March where we we, we suddenly went off the boil. Um, and we played Bristol City on a Friday night match, and it all kicked off in, uh, towards the end. And yeah. we ended up having we, had, we ended up having Moody and Harris sent off, which ruled That's them out right. for a few games. Yeah, That's and, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and suddenly we were very short on strikers. Um, Rotherham and Reading had just picked up form from nowhere, and they they'd appeared from nowhere. And I think Rotherham actually took over from the at the top from us for a little while. We had yeah. Rotherham to play at home. We had no stri- well, no strikers. We had you know very few strikers. And so Mickey had to go out and get he bought he got Steve Claridge and Tony Cotty in the transfer window. Um but also, yeah, also uh Richard Sadlier, who was had a terrible time of injuries, was just coming back from injury from another injury layoff. Um yeah. unfortunately he came into the side and he literally he just hit the ground running. He was just absolutely fantastic. And that was, you know, some of his best form. I think we played four home games in a week or something ridiculous. We I think we battered Rotherham, then we beat yeah. Stoke and Port Vale. And that was that little run that just just as it just just as you thought. I mean, it was shades of the previous season when at one one point in ninety nine two thousand we had a chance to get automatic promotion with just with three matches in a week if we'd won them, and we managed to lose two of them. I think it was Burnley and Preston, and then we drew it home to Gillingham, and suddenly we were struggling to get a playoff place. And for a little while, when Rotherham and Reading sort of caught up with us, it looked like that was going to happen again. But those those four matches or three matches in the home matches in a week where we battered Rotherham and beat Port Bell and Stoke and sadly it was so good coming in. It was just, it, that, that was it then. We just put us in pole position. I think that the icing on the cake that season was the 5-1 at Cambridge. Where yeah, I wonderful evening. The, wonderful best, evening. Yeah, for a hat trick, best, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, one of the best hat tricks you'll ever see. It was just absolutely stunning. And that, that was, I think, when we knew we were up then and we knew we were a class above the rest, really. Yeah, 5-1 away at, mm, at Cambridge yeah. United. Um, that followed one of my favourite fixtures of the season, one that I can still remember, flash memories of now, as yeah. I'm speaking, listeners, that was the 4-0 oh, you know, yeah. Rotherham at home, yeah. where I think was it Ronnie Moore was managing Rotherham. He said they, they were beaten as they got off the coach, didn't they? Yeah. You know, it was, yeah. it, the atmosphere yeah. was, was huge. It was. It, it was brilliant, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was Carriage's home debut when he got a, a couple of goals, didn't he, I think? And yeah, it was just yeah, it was right. one of those days where everything just went right and there was always that fear in the back of your mind that we we would maybe choke or run with nick would nick a win but it was no doubt right from the first whistle like you say the atmosphere was just was it was amazing and that was yeah that was one of the one of the top one of my top games as well to be honest absolutely uh, and then obviously the famous away draw at rex and mm. which um to, yeah did that secure promotion did it secure the championship i, I, I can't remember which way round it that was, was yeah that that secure promotion um i think we we, we needed a win but i think reading Blew, uh, blew it at Colchester. I think Reading lost to Colchester that day. Yeah. Um, so it meant promotion was guaranteed. A point was enough. And I think we just needed a point or we needed a, yeah, to, to avoid defeat at home to Oldham to win the title. But again, there's another one. Where the, amply. Yeah, we amply avoided defeat yeah, against Oldham, that was, didn't we? That was never in any doubt. And that contained one of the best goals I think I've seen. And that's um, Stephen Reed's blockbuster. Yes. I, you know, ever, I was behind that goal and I've never seen a ball hit so hard in my life. It's just... Incredible the way the way, the way yeah the way the way he could strike a ball his technique was 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 scary you know and again you don't Absolutely. appreciate it until you look back and you look at one after the other the goals he got two at Rotherham that season even though he lost three two but he's yeah his technique his composure the way he hit a ball um, wonderful you know, he's sort of on the sweet spot every time he just absolutely smacked it in so he fully deserved to, to you know to go on I don't think anyone begrudged him or or um, Kale when, when they eventually left for the Premier League. I don't think any any fans truly begrudged them because they were good servants and they were just such good players and they deserved to to, to be on a bigger stage, really. But um, but yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We we would of course finish champions of. I think it was called Division Two back then, wasn't it? It was still called Div- Yes, it was Division Two, yes. third mm. tier in third division mm. in my old days. Yeah, know, third tier mm. Division Two. Mill will be champions, two points ahead of Rotherham. Um, top scorer for the season with 28 goals, mm. <laughs> Neil Harris. Um, yeah. and then closely followed by a wonderful cameo player, really, in, in terms of Mill history. But what a contribution from Paul Moody! 14 oh, Moody goals, was 
Moody was one of those players who, when you saw him scoring goals for other teams, I think it was Oxford he was at mostly. You saw yeah. the sort of play you thought, you thought, I wish we could sign him. You know, he would. You knew you knew he would do well at Millwall. And when we did sign him, I think other players like that. I think Claridge was a similar player. Um, Dave Mitchell, um, yep. Carlos Edwards. Funny enough, you know, not not just talking about strikers. I always remember Carlos Edwards thinking what a great player he looked and thinking he would work really well at Millwall, and he did. Um, and it, it was, yeah, Moody was just, he was such a professional. He was so, so professional. And I think Very was, strong player. Um, mm. but actually, actually quite skillful. I remember, I can't remember which, yeah. but he scored, he he scored against, um, I've, I've a sense it might have been um, Oxford, but I could be wrong. Mm. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, he was a big man, and mm. like a lot, of, like a lot of big men, are often quite delicate on their feet. And he, you yeah, know, he was known, known as a yeah. as a battering ram, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he pulled a little kind of a, a little jink inside the. Mm. Um, I think it was Oxford. I could well be wrong. I think it was. I think um, you're right. Yeah, it done a little kind of shimmy on the ball. I thought, wow, that's mm. that's not what you expect from a player of his um, mm. physicality. Um, yeah, great, great striker. And then obviously Tim Cahill on ten goals. I mean, mm. three double double figure. I know, strong. yeah. <laughs> the goal scorers yeah. for the in yeah. all comps, yeah. in all comps, yeah. Um, wonderful. The, the five nil win over Oldham was. I mean, we've, we've touched on Reed's goal already, but it's mm. just a wonderful one of those sunny days that lives in your memory, a bit like nineteen eighty eight for us old older yeah. fans. Absolutely. Um, and the kind of day where you would um, you'd, you'd love to go back to just for uh, just for a moment, just to experience yeah, it again. But absolutely, the, the thing was that at this period, this was a bit of a golden era, really, because we had success mm. built on success. We would then get promoted, obviously, to what was called Division One, <clears throat> the championship mm. now, where we would surge towards the playoffs. Merv, it was a wonderful season to it, be a real was. fan, wasn't it? Yeah, it got off to a bit of a weird start because I think we, we had Norwich at home first. We battered them 4 0. Then we travelled to Birmingham and we were 4 0 down at half time. So it sort of. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it of, uh, yeah. It sort of made us realise, well, perhaps we're not going to, you know, perhaps we're not going to have it all our own way. And, and we had a bit of a stuttery start. I think we got beat home to Burnley. Um, yeah. I think the turning point at the start of the season was when we went to Palace and beat yes. 3 1 there. And when you watch the yeah. footage back of that, the, the way we dominated them. And the way we just picked them off was just, you know, we. It's like we just the second half, especially when it, it, it we went in at one all. I think I think it was, and once That's we got right, the lead, yeah. no, yeah, there was there was no way we were going to relinquish it. And you look at it and you think it should have been another, it should have been another, another West Ham Mother's Day massacre. Really, it should have been four or five or six one. It would have been good to have really humiliated game. them. It was, yeah. Was, I mean, we just, yeah. I was living over in Croydon. Oh, right. <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful day yeah. to be a Millwall fan in the months of that, you know. Yeah, but um, but things I think they just seem to kick up again in the new year, and I think we did briefly get to second spot. Um, I think we, we yeah, beat I think we did. Yeah, I, yeah. Think we beat, I think we beat, beat Watford. I think in midweek in January we were second, and I think I think there's a few factors that season that probably stopped us from getting automatic promotion. One was I think that Kevin Keegan's Man City was so dominant, I and mean, they was only ever going to be. One, mm. one, one, top other, team, one, yeah. one place up for grabs, really, yeah. And um, yeah, and obviously we had bad luck with injuries again. You know, obviously we lost sadly. Uh, I mean, he was fairly ably replaced by Dion Dublin, but um, and you do have to wonder. And obviously, there's far more serious things that, that, than mere football matches. But obviously, again, I touch on it in the book. But you do have to wonder what would have happened if we'd had a fully fit Neil Harrison, Richard Sadlier uh, in that season. Yeah. I think we, I think we would have comfortably got second place, but. Obviously, Harris, yeah, um, cancer diagnosis, um, took him out for the season pretty yeah, much, didn't put, it? Yeah, yeah put, put things in perspective, and yet he was able to still to come back and score that memorable goal at Watford on New Year's Day, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, again, another wonderful. golden moment, really. Yeah, which and it, it shows the spirit of of the guy, really. And, um, but yeah, it was a shame. I think we had injuries to a few injuries to Kale, Tim Kale, as well, a, a sort of vital moment. We had a again, terrible March. I'm just looking yeah, at this March, results. March seems to be the month for Millwall for some reason. We, um, I think we lost we were the eyes football. of March, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, um, losses, we lost, just looking at them. Yeah. yeah, and we lost, yeah, I think we lost that over Sheffield Wednesday. Um, and That's McGee right. had bought in, yeah, yeah. McGee had bought in, um, McPhail on loan. And, McFowl, um, there's a name, there's a name from the Steve, past that just Stephen McFowl, and he had an absolute nightmare. Got sent off. Uh, we lost <laughs> to a late goal. Then we went to Sheffield United. I think we were two one up with five minutes to go and still got beat. And yeah, yeah. The, the season the season seemed to be unraveling again in March. But um, 
you know, we pulled it around. Dublin was was brilliant, considering he was only on loan for a few matches, you know. And, yeah, I mean, um, he, was, he was an able servant. I mean, we turned it around. He with was. Yeah. Stockport 3-0. And then yeah. huge, yeah. huge night. I remember this game against Wolves, Wolves 17. Yeah, it was massive. It's one yeah, of those massive amazing. nights, Merv, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, there are yeah. certain nights where you can almost touch the atmosphere and, and we'd, yeah, we'd, we'd win it by um, a the carriage penalty. penalty, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, remember, um, I remember the way Carriage was so cool when he, he just just picked himself up and just, just stuck yeah. it away. As if, if it was a, a, a training ground penalty, you know, it was that was, I think that was the, having people like Claridge and Dublin in the squad, you know, it's, it's their experience more than anything else. And I think this... Massively experienced you know, players. It, and I, and um, I think this this is the, this is true of when we had Kale back as well for his second spell and we went on that, that amazing run, which almost ended in, you know, a playoff place under Neil Harris yeah. in 2017, I think, it was, or 2018. And, um, People say, you know, you never played, you never scored. But I think just having his presence around the club, so experienced at Premier League level, international level, but mostly at Millwall level. You know, he, he knows what it takes to be a successful Millwall team. And I think people like that. I mean, I've when we have the manager debate on on, on Twitter or whatever, mm. I've, I've often brought up the name of Stephen Reid, who's a very accomplished coach. You know, but obviously, he's, he's backed away from the game at the moment because of various personal reasons. But... And people yeah. have sort of shut, shut me down and said, "Oh, just because he played for Mill doesn't mean he's going to be a good coach or a good manager." But it's not the it's not just the fact that he's played for Millwall. He's one of the you know there are very few Millwall players who go on to sort of um, top flight success, international success in, in, in yes. various ways. Yeah. You know, yeah. People like sharing them, you know, there's very few that do it. You know, like Kael went and played in the Premier League for Everton in World Cups for Australia. Stephen Reid, people forget, I think, has coached in the Premier League. He's coached in that Scottish national team. You know, the sort of he experience. Has, yeah. Yeah, the sort yeah. of experience that you'll bring from that alone. And then you you bolt onto that, the experience of being in a successful Millwall team. I think yeah. it's a, it's a win, winning combination, but, you know, it's, it's never going to happen. In the same way as we're never going to get Sean Dyche down there as manager, which if, if Rowett does go, that's um, that's the name that's going to be bandied about. But there's, there's absolutely no chance of that, not on £5 million. I think Dyche, a Dyche would be too expensive for us now. He, yeah, having, he, was, having... he, was on, he was on £5 million a year at Burnley. And I think he's yeah. holding out for... Um, for that for, for a, a Premier League job, you know, and I think once yeah. we get close to the transfer window, Premier League clubs will be looking to change and then I think he'll be a prime candidate. But I mean, yeah, the, the dream team for me, and it sounds a bit too idealistic, but I think having people like Dyche and Reed and Cahill, you know, behind the scenes with their all their experience, all their non mill experience, but more importantly their actual mill all experience of all being in the same successful team would be I think I think that's a be a dream ticket, but it's, it's one we're never going to have, unfortunately. Uh, that will be that will be a dream. Um, <laughs> I think so. We would eventually get into the playoffs mm -hmm. after a win over Grimsby, and I'm going to yeah. gloss over the playoffs, Merv. Yeah, I think we better add. Yeah, <laughs> on this show, we've, I think we've I, I, you know I think we've all done it to death over time. Yeah, but yeah, we, we yeah. would fail at the last against Birmingham. Yeah, and the yeah. Achtung, Milbal. History. I always found the 2002-3 season. I mean, it kind of lived in the shadow of the events of yeah. at the end of 2001-2002, of, uh, and mm -hmm. we never quite kick-started. It's, it's a strange. In the midst of all of these seasons, I just listed them out to before Merv and I spoke, listeners, and was, there's like success on success, and then mm -hmm. right in the middle of it, it's one very forgettable season, 2002-3, yeah. <laughs> where. Effectively, nothing much happened, really, did it? it was, no, it was, it was very much. Season. Yeah, I think in the book, I, I called this particular spell the, the hangover, and it was very much a hangover, hangover. season. Yeah. yeah. Um, similar to the season following the um, Derby playoff defeat, 93-94. Yeah. 94-95 was very quiet. It was like the, the, the club didn't really want any any incident. They didn't want to put their head above the parapet at all and then almost thinking, oh, don't, don't go for promotion because something might go wrong. And... I think it was similar, and of course the season started with a six 0 home drubbing from Rotherham. Yeah, when sure. In fact, yeah. I was looking. At, I've got an old edition, mm. the Lion Roars here still, where they right. published um, yeah. like a list of criminals wanted for you know. Yeah. Have you yeah. seen these men? You know, um, yeah, great, great so front page. Yeah. yeah, and there's various conspiracy theories. And one of the frustrating things about writing this book was I was able to unearth so many anecdotes about mainly involving the chairman. But none mm. of which I could use because obviously I don't want to get sued. <laughs> no, I but, um, and, yeah, and they're all yeah. I mean, they're all supposition. They're all they're all um, you know conspiracy theories. But of course, one of the conspiracy theories at the time was that the players had been promised <clears throat> uh, certain bonuses because of the success yeah. of the previous season. 
but because of the of what had gone on and the enforced membership scheme and then that, that wasn't possible so this was like money their, was their short pro- money was yeah short, so this was their yeah. protest game apparently but there's never that's never been substantiated it's all no it's all no. um no it, it's all water cooler talk but um but yeah it was a very bland season but i think you sort of you need one of them when you've had a, a rocky season the, the one before um yeah and um i think i think what one thing i did mention in the book is one of the unsung heroes of that that period was um ray harford um, yes, who I think, big, big loss when he passed away for the club. Yeah, I think I think talking about that change from when Stevens and McCleary left and McGee took over, uh, I think what, what was probably more instrumental in that period than people realised was I think Harford went from perhaps a purely advisory position. He probably just, you know, just, just lent Rhino and Macca the benefit of his experience as and when they needed it. So I think perhaps he was given a bit more of a say. More active, and I yeah. Think, uh, yeah, and I think his experience really brought on the younger players. I think that's what helped him make that leap. And uh, of course, yeah, he, he passed away at the start of the two thousand three two thousand four season. I think. Um, yeah, another another, yeah. another lock of the club. One thing yeah, that's always which, struck yeah. me is, um, you know, we, we we talk a lot about John Berylson not being mm. a ruthless chairman, though, and, and mm, maybe yeah. he hangs on his loyalty. Some might say um goes on you know further than than, than maybe it should sometimes but yeah, whether, yeah. whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is, is another mm. question but theo could be quite ruthless when push came to shove couldn't he i mean you, you've mentioned already he, he knows when who he knew when to make a change I and mean, he made a change Absolutely. yeah early in the 2003 four season when when mcgee was was axed and then came what will turn out to be a very successful duo of, of dennis wise and, and ray wilkins another very experienced man of course yeah yeah, I think the team at the time was crying out for a bit of experience on the pitch. Um, I think it was no no secret that um, I think Wilkins was a... Theo was a friend of Wilkins, I think, and in turn, Wilkins um, enabled Theo to sign Dennis Wise, who Palace were keen on sign at the time. And yeah. that, that that led to another quite funny chapter in the, the saga of Theo Pafitis versus Simon Jordan, which he would use his, <laughs> he would use his, pro, he would use his programme notes to sort of like you know, do his bit. And it was actually quite comical. And in truth, they were like good mates. And yet, it was yeah, all, yeah. For, to use the horrible word banter, but I mean, he actually, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he actually, he actually did a program piece just after we signed wise, basically mocking Palace for not getting you know, Palace had done a piece in their program, slagging Millwall off and questioning wise's ambition for signing for Millwall. So yeah, yeah. it was in that, piece, that in that piece that Perfitis, uh, dubbed them as crippled, crippled Alice and playing at Smellhurst Park. You no, know, real five-year-old playground stuff. But for the sharing crippled of a Alice club, looks old, used, I can see that knocking around. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, you know. So it was. It, yeah, you had, to, you had to admire it, really. You know, and I think it was a. And as I say, so, so Wise come and Dennis Wise was one of those players again that split opinion. You know, a lot of fans weren't keen, and others thought he could be good. And and to be fair to him, I think he made quite an impact on the playing side and McGee seemed to lose his way. Yeah. And there was a few, I mean, of course it was, well, <clears throat> it was the era of Bob Peters, of course. He's a, <laughs> uh, yeah. An everlasting mill enigma who come in, did very little, then got a last minute equaliser against Palace and then two absolutely cracking goals at Gillingham. Yeah. Um, and then su- suddenly, even though he was scoring, he was out of favour. And I think it was, I think we, played, we played, yeah, we played Preston at home and the, 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 the Team selection was very bizarre, and I think we got beat, or it might have been a draw, and that was it. And McGee was out, and um, in came, and then when, in yeah, came yeah. and Wilkins, yeah, I yeah, think and followed um, a, a formation change, another another current, um, you know, hot hot potato at the moment. Formation changes, mm. I think. Didn't yeah, uh, I noticed was Peterborough was it? Was it, or, 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 was it five the five three two? No, Preston. Sorry, Preston. Mm. Um, yeah, he totally changed their formation. Some say yeah. it was like a. Uh, almost, you know, sack me kind of um, move. Well, yeah, by I think the game, which was, she yeah. Yeah. Mm. But um, but, but yeah, the Wise era got off to quite a shaky start. I think we won the first match under, under Forest, but I think then we went four without a win. Yeah. Um, and at the time, Perfitis was saying he was actively looking for a new manager. He'd had sixty applicants. Um, we'd, we'd gone four matches without a win, and so we're thinking, well, one of these sixty better come in quick. And next thing you know. Wise and Wilkins have got the job permanently, which you know is a bit of an eyebrow raiser. But mm. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say once they got the job permanently, they started to bring in their own players, um, which got us Danny Dicchio and you know Marshall yeah. and Gold. And yeah. I think most notably, um, 
Kevin Muscat was a different player, you know, initially under McGee and more perhaps maybe more notably Archie Knox, who was McGee's new right hand man who had a bit of a reputation, a bit of a fearsome reputation. I think Mus yeah, Muscat started out as someone who just went around kicking people and getting himself sent off and suspended. And then under Wise, an oddly delicate, delicate defender as well. Um, yeah, yeah. A strange combination of brutality Definitely. and skill, wasn't yeah. he? You know, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think it was his one of his first games, a televised match at Watford. And I think it was one all, and uh, he was just walking the ball out of the area, and the Watford bloke had a kick at him, and rather than just you know walk away or clear the ball, he turned mm. around and stamped on him and got sent off. And he we lost the game. Walk away from that. He can't walk away yeah. from that. Man. No. You've got to stamp on. No. Him. Yeah, <laughs> that, and then that's, that's suddenly, the musket yeah. approach. You know? <laughs> yeah, and then suddenly these you know this uh, Dickio, um, uh, Danny Dickio, and, and yeah. Muscat is, is, is providing the, the, the ammunition for Dickio to score the goals that would, would get us to the cup final. The, the, cup, the cup run, obviously, is the standout standout event of the season. It but is. also a sense of what if, because... Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, this we, we late late in the season, we started to mount um, when you, a playoff oh, run, yeah. but that would go off the boil, man, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was honestly, it was actually quite heartbreaking reliving that season. I forgot how how good we were and on what a chance we had, probably our best ever chance to get into the Premier League without actually getting to the playoffs. Because when you look at what happened at the end of the season, obviously we, we wouldn't swap that day out at Old Trafford for anything really, you know, but no. you can see the minute, the minute we booked our place in the cup final, the, the, the league form went off a cliff. All the while we were no, getting well, there. Did get injured, did they? No, all the, all the while we were getting there, it was great, you know, and we'd actually gone from mid table to, you know, quite, firmly in the playoff places um and the teams around us then were very very average i mean there was a there was a mm. there was a, a sunderland team who were very average west brom who were, weren't great a west ham team dare i say who obviously we batted 4-1 yeah. Uh, yeah these were our possible playoff opponents and all we had to do was keep that form going yeah. um but as you, as you say i mean i think two games after we beat uh, Sunderland in the Cup semi-final. We got battered four 0 by Coventry. I think we had about four or five four games. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and um, and and it was a shame because at the end of the season, while we were looking forward to the, the Cup final, you had a situation where Palace, who when we beat them, I think earlier in the season, were third from bottom. Palace yeah. nicked the sixth. Palace basically nicked the sixth place on the last day of the season. They struggled to beat a very average Sunderland team. Um, West Ham beat awful Ipswich team who we were in shocking money trouble at the time and basically let us have Andy Marshall without any sort of restrictions to the point where he played for us against them while on loan to us at their place and we beat them quite comfortably and the the, the playoff final was West Ham versus Palace and bloody Palace won it you know coming from yeah. nowhere to finish sixth against a team that we battered 4-1 um so it was you went you sort of went to that cup final with a sense of a real bittersweet sense of thinking, you know, this perhaps should be yeah. the starter to the main course next weekend where we're playing West Ham for placing the, the, the Premier League, although God knows what would have happened with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say the cliche of what, the, 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 the loss of um, the loss of the, the playoff spot is one of the great what ifs. And then, then you've mentioned the possibility that it would have involved the West Ham final. Mm, That's one of the great what ifs. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, given, given the. Um, it's such a good one. <laughs> yeah. Given what the, you know, given how quite how quite lax the segregation was at the cup final, you know, oh, he was able to mingle freely with the United fans with not, not much issue. But I think it would have been a bit different seven days later. That would have, yeah. So maybe in one respect, one of the great what ifs mm, you know, in, all, in all senses of, of the words. Um, Absolutely. In that way, I mean, top scorer for the season that year was was uh, Tim Cahill with twelve, and then Danny Deco. Yeah. Uh, I knew how it came in late, didn't it? Yeah, uh, Deco had eight, eight mm -hmm. for the season, sorry. Um, and we'd finish in in tenth spot, but um, wonderful days. I mean, the Sunderland semi final lives for mm -hmm. in your mind. That, you know, as as the Mother's Day massacre does. But there's yeah, yeah. These, these these moments are what live with you forever. Um Definitely, cup yeah. final to some extent. I, I I enjoyed the cup final, but it was it was it was a bittersweet sense, I think. And we went into it quite um in we lost Dikio, hadn't we? In in the in lost the, in the to a really, really harsh sending off at Forest a couple of weeks before. He basically got into a yeah. tangle with the Forest defender. Sort of thing that usually you get a ticking off for, maybe a yellow each and the ref decided it was all about him and he was going to send them both off. We appealed it and there was no joy. And then, of course, 
Muscat actually did his knee in the sun, in the semi final. I think he did injured. Wasn't he? And, yeah, yeah, that's right. So there, yeah. there was they were two key players that would have given us perhaps a bit of a chance of giving Man United a game. But as it was, it yeah. was you know it was the Ronaldo show really. He absolutely dominated that match and gave poor Robbie Ryan a terrible time. Yeah, so, I mean that would that would be Ryan's Robbie Ryan's last game in the Mill mm-hmm. shirt. I think yeah, straight, yeah. straight up against mm-hmm. Cristiano Ronaldo, world yeah. world class yeah. player. Yeah, um, t- football's a strange game in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the two thousand four final. I mean, we, we, you, you've described two thousand two three as a hangover season. That was a bit of a hangover season as well. Does, does the book cover that season, Murph? It does. Yeah, that's the final one. Yeah, the, um, which would be famously the European excursion, and say then, the, the European tour. Yeah, yeah, and then a bit um, of a hangover. Otherwise, really, it was a bit of a nothing season apart from it, that. It was, but, you know, it was a strange one because I think it was the first time um, that Theo really started to get some stick from the fans. You know, we didn't get for the best of starts. Um, mm. Like I said, the, the European adventure lasted just 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 the two games. Um, away, yeah, yeah, and um, and I think. I can't remember which game it was now. One of the one of the games, people started asking Theo where the FA Cup money had gone. Um, people were assuming that you know we'd, we'd made two and a half million quid out of the cup run. So where was it? Why can't you spend it where on the players? The players? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was shortly after that that Theo announced he was stepping down into the season. Um, fans, sort of, a, 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 some section of the support thought it was a direct result of that, but it actually wasn't. You know, he 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 always planned to do it to step down. Because at this this time his TV career was taking off, Dragons Den yeah. and that sort of thing, and yeah, it did start yeah. to unravel very quickly. I mean, I think we um, we had a point where Wise Dennis Wise really felt he only needed a few more additions to kick on from the previous season. Forget about the cups, get, get the UEFA Cup out of the way, and really go for promotion. Uh, he brought in Scott Doby, striker yes. Barry Howes, um, yeah. and you know he basically got got what he asked for, which was a bit more investment in the team. He brought in Dobie and Hales, and uh, we went into Christmas looking really good. I mean, the, the Dobie, Hales, and Dickio strike force was looking oh, really yeah. good. Yeah, and I think we went into the new year in sixth. Uh, we played Rotherham at the Den, it's first cup league game of the new year. I think uh, yeah. the young the young Alan Dunn, there we are. Yeah, yeah. A, a young yeah. Alan, a young Alan Dunn gave us the lead. Everything was looking rosy, and then it all started to go wrong. Rotherham come back and beat us uh, a few weeks later. Um, Obviously, because we were a listed company, our, our, our financial figures were revealed that we'd made a sort of like a five or six million pound operating loss. Mm. Uh, literally within hours of that announcement, Dobie was sold for the same for the same price we paid for him. Uh, Thirteen <laughs> weeks after signing him, and the old familiar fire fire sale began basically, and we were you know sort of told that uh, you know we would have to sell players to make up the the, 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 the losses, and I think. Yeah, I mean, Theo Pafit is admitted at the time that, you know, he said that every season football's a gamble. Um, and up until then, the, the, the gamble had paid off. But for, for the first time, it, it actually hadn't. I think wages have gone up a million quid in the last 12 months. Um, and uh, yeah, it just, um, it, it, I think it showed the importance of perhaps sacrificing that cup final place as, as good as it was for, for getting in the Premier League because had, Things worked out differently. Had we perhaps, I don't know, maybe lost lost to Sunderland at Old Trafford one nil instead of winning one nil, and then gone on a little. We'd have been in the big time, Merv, wouldn't we? In the yeah, yeah, the yeah, at the top table. Yeah, and yet you couldn't you couldn't really imagine not having that FA Cup sort of uh, adventure to look back on. You know that that day in Sunderland and that KL goal and the celebrations afterwards were, and and the day at, at Cardiff, you know, was still great leading up to the kickoff at least, you know. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's 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 the nature of football. You know, that's 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 what it is. It's what it's, it always has been. It always will be. You're going to have a, a, um, an interesting period. Uh, last five years of the 2000 because the 2005 six season. Um, I'm taking it that's not included in this. In this, um, no, it's not. No, no. I've it's going to be your next go, phase. Yeah. yeah, that's that 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 was where the wheels. Well, they didn't just come off. They disappeared oh, into the uh, well, and, well and truly. Into, yeah, into the, 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 the side of the road from some way. Yeah. Back, so. the, the short reign of Jeff Burnage as chairman, yeah, and the short <laughs> reign of Steve Claridge and Colin Lee and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's, that's all yeah, to come. yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. That's all to come in the next edition. Merv, I really take my hat off to you producing these these books. You and I have spoken a few times over over yeah. over time. 
and yeah. you 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 do what I keep telling myself. I should, I should do something yeah. like that. I never do. I start with one paragraph what? and then. Well, once, once you do it, once you do it, that's it. You get addicted to it, and it becomes a lot easier. But yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm, but yeah, um, I've been yeah, I've been quite lucky to sort of find the time to do it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just enjoyable, you know. It's it's therapeutic to be honest. As as, as much as I enjoy reading books, you know, to relax, yeah. I, I love I love writing them as well, and sort of immersing yourself in the, the sort of various periods and surrounding yourself with programs and paper cuttings and, and videos of goals and stuff like that. It's really enjoyable, and I'm hope Wonderful. I hope that I am I'm able to sort of relay the last sort of 20, 30 years anywhere half as good as jim murray did with dines of the south really that's sort of the aim um well that's that's, yeah, the, that's the bar but yeah. yeah you are you are doing it you are doing that mate yeah. and yeah. i'll take my hat off to you um so the name of the book listeners daydreams and nightmares it covers the first five years of the 2000s as uh, the seasons we that merv and i have been speaking about Millwall fc in the 2000s part one part two Probably won't include, well, it might, it will build towards some measure of success after a few years of tumult. But anyway, that's to come. 1099 listeners on victorpublishing.co.uk um, by Merv Payne. And, yeah, it's um, available. It's pre ordered at the moment and it's out in November. So, um, yeah, so you can pre order it now on at Victor Publishing. And then I think it's the 1st of November. It's out on Amazon and all the other, all that sort of, sort of paper. You can get, get your get orders in. in. Christmas is coming. <laughs> Get your orders in, listeners. We we will continue to mention it. So I'm a big admirer of what Merv does here. Um, Merv, we, I want to say thank you for coming on. We we finally made okay. the call. Um, we had a little bit of a rocky period, um, but we've overcome that. This is the Mill story. We had a bit of a rocky period, and then we come through <laughs> with some success at the end of it. Yeah. Huge, huge thank you, Merv Payne. Thank you, Thanks, Merv. Nick. Thanks a lot. And thank you to you too, dear listeners. Expect to hear more adverts and mentions for Merv's book daydreams and nightmares 1099 from victorpublishing.co.uk until the next edition of Actung Mill it's uh, goodbye from me Nick Hart and Merv Payne at Eva Dirty Mill and bye for now Achtung Millwall.